Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Ross. I'm the student pastor here at Fellowship Church, and I'll be speaking to you today in our final message for our He Gets Us series. I want to ask you a question. Are you or someone you know a chronically late person? You know, this is the type of person where if they need to be somewhere at 9 o'clock, you're telling them to arrive at 8.45, hoping that if you do that, they'll show up at the right time. How many of you here watching right now would admit that you are that late person everywhere you go? I mean, come on, are you watching this message right now because you missed the first 15 minutes of mine in person on Sunday morning? No, just kidding. Uh, but yeah, some of us here watching, you probably are that late person. Uh, but what is more frustrating though than having to wait on a person who's late? You know, that person where you're you're trying to go somewhere, you have some place you need to be, you're the person who likes to be on time, even likes to be early, yet you're waiting for somebody else to arrive or to get ready. It's frustrating. You know, how long do you wait in that coffee shop for your friend to arrive before you get up and leave? And you can think of so many strategies to be on time, right? Just wake up earlier. Just leave five minutes earlier. If you're late to the meeting all the time, coming in with a Dunkin' Donuts coffee, don't stop at Dunkin'. Don't take that back road that you think is faster because it's not. See, we've all felt that way towards people before in our life who we have to wait on. Um, but I wanna ask you this. Have you ever felt that way towards God? Have you ever felt in your relationship with Him through your faith in Him that he has been late, that you've been waiting on him to come through for you and you're just sitting there and you're like, God, why are you choosing to be late? Why haven't you arrived? Why haven't you come through? Why haven't you answered my prayer, God? Where are you? I'm sure if you're watching this right now, you felt that way in one time or another. Maybe you're feeling that way right now and you're just wondering and you're praying, God, I need you to show up. Why are you making me wait for you? Perhaps you would say that you're waiting on a miracle. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to address that and hopefully, you know, look at a story in scripture that I believe can encourage us where we can find why God chooses to be late sometimes. And the miracle we're going to look at today is one of the greatest miracles that Jesus ever performed for somebody in his earthly ministry here. And this miracle in particular in this story would be one that would take place just a few days before Palm Sunday. So if you're watching this, maybe you're watching it on Palm Sunday. But this one miracle would be what sets in the chain reaction. It would put everything in motion that would lead to all the events of the Holy Week, which would lead to Jesus being arrested, which would lead to him being put on that cross for us, which would lead to his resurrection. And so I didn't plan it for it to work chronologically with today being Palm Sunday. It just worked out that way. It's another God thing right there. Uh, but I'll tell you in a minute why I wanted to talk about this, this particular story. But we can find it in John chapter 11. It says this, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. So his sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. So here we have some friends of Jesus. They're pleading with Jesus, Hey, your friend Lazarus, he's sick. Our brother is sick. Jesus, we need you to get here quickly. And I love the way that they say it. I love the tone, Mary and Martha, when they're writing this letter to Jesus. The one you love, Jesus, is sick. I don't know if it's passive aggressive, like you need to get here right now. Or maybe they're trying to write this letter in a way that will definitely convince Jesus to come. But they're like, hey, Jesus, Lord, the one you love so much is sick. Here's what we need to understand here is that Jesus was good friends with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And from time to time, he would find himself in their home sharing a meal together. And because of that, in the heat of this moment, when death hangs in the balance, where does their focus go? What seems to seep to the surface of their soul is not Lazarus' love for Jesus. It wasn't their love for Jesus. But in this life and death moment, 
What seems to surface in their brain, in their heart, in their soul, is what will move Jesus is to remind him of the love that he has for his friend. Jesus, the one that you love so much is ill and needs you right now in this moment. We need you to come. We need you to heal him, Jesus. Maybe you feel like that today. Maybe that's your prayer too. Jesus, the one you love is ill. I need you to perform a miracle for me. So why is this important? Well, let's take a look at verse number five. It says, now Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. John makes a point to put this verse in here to, to, to solidify the fact that Jesus did love Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. This is this agape type of love in the Greek for that word love. It's this unconditional, sacrificial type of love, this God type of love. When the Bible says God is love in 1 John, it's God is agape. He loves unconditionally. He loves us sacrificially. And it's more than an emotion. It's an act of will. And this is the same love that Jesus wants us to have for one another. He wants us to agape one another. This God type of love. And John makes it clear. Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And this is important to the story because that same love that God has, that same love that Jesus has for Mary, Martha, and Lazarus is the same love he has towards us. But that makes verse 6 even more confusing to us. Verse 6 says that Jesus loved, agape, Mary and Martha and Lazarus so much when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. He loved them so much he said, I'm not going to go. I'm going to stay right here. I'm going to choose to be late. I'm going to have them have to wait on me. You have this incredible, sacrificial, unconditional love for them, but God, you waited. I know we can think like that sometimes, right? In just these few verses, we can find ourselves here as, God, I know you love me. I know you love me unconditionally. I believe in that, yet why are you choosing to wait in my situation? Why are you not coming through? Why aren't you performing the miracle we're asking? The one you love needs you, Jesus. Now, the reason why I wanted to talk about this particular story is because I myself have been struggling physically for the past couple months with pain, discomfort, and anxiousness anxiousness. And sometimes I'm reluctant to share my pain, especially with those of you watching, because number one, I'm not looking for an ounce of pity. Like I don't want someone uh, to, to feel bad for me. I'm not that type of person. That's why I keep quiet about it. And also like the way I think, I'm like, I know that people that are watching, you are going through something so much worse than I am. I know that there are people in our church and people in our community that are suffering way more than I am to a greater degree. And I can compare myself with them and be like, no, let's put all, all our prayer power towards them. I don't need the prayers right now. That's how selfishly I think sometimes. I would call that selfishly. Like, hey, I don't want people to have to pray for me. But you know what? I also say that to you today to encourage you not to discredit your pain, not to discredit your suffering just because somebody else is going through something worse. This is part of our human experience here is that we all are going to suffer. We're all going to have pain in our life. This world is broken. And so don't minimize your, your suffering to someone else's because here's the deal. There will always be somebody who had it worse. And Jesus himself suffered as well to a, degrade, a greater degree than we could ever understand. But for me, at the age of 15, I was diagnosed with degenerative disc disease. And I know that sounds bad. It's not really a disease. It's more of a disorder. And it Long story short, I got a bad back and I have flare-ups, okay? I've been living with this for about 15 years. Most of the time, by the grace of God, I have no problems. Uh, but just about a month ago, basically from right now, uh, today, my back started to flare up. And what made this particularly time more difficult is that I was also dealing with a lot of GI and digestion issues and I won't get into detail there, but like there's something going on and I'm in the process of figuring it out, going to the doctors, going through the motions and you know, all that takes time. Um, but I'm in this period of waiting. I'm in this period of anxiousness, this period of wondering why is this happening? Why am I feeling this way? And to top it all off, this pain, this flare up in my back begins 
on the first day I'm in Florida. The first day of my vacation about a month ago when I got to go to Florida. Uh, first vacation about two years, right? Just with the busyness of, the, of a new baby and not wanting to travel and stuff like that. Uh, the first family vacation, my back is hurting. And you know what? I had a real intimate moment with God where I walked out on the beach in Florida and I started talking to God. I'm sharing with him how angry I am, how unhappy I am. And in a real moment when I'm on the beach, I'm looking up to God and I'm just telling him, God, the one you love is ill. Where are you? Why is this happening to me right now? And it kind of reminds me of the story. Like, I know that God loves me. I know that he does, but it feels like you're on vacation as well, God, and you're not coming to my aid. I just got so frustrated because I'm like, I'm finally on this vacation. I'm finally going to relax, but now, boom, I'm in this back pain and I'm still in back pain right now as I'm sitting here on this hard stool, right? And so all of that just makes me just, you know, wonder the same thing that, and asking for the same thing that, you know, Mary and Martha are asking for Lazarus here. Jesus, the one you love is ill, but it feels like you're choosing to wait. You're choosing not to come to my aid. Um, you're choosing to make me wait on you. See, maybe you're sitting here today and you're watching this and you've had a similar experience or have a similar experience right now and you're praying like I did and I do right now. God, I need you. See, what happens to our faith when we're waiting on God and it just seems like he's not responding? See, our souls can become so troubled because what happens is we become so preoccupied of looking for that purpose behind our pain. We're looking for two things. We're looking for an explanation and we're looking for a feeling. We're looking for why is this happening? Why me? God, what is going on? Why won't you come? What's the point of this? And number two, we're looking for a feeling. God, make me feel better. Heal me. Make, make me feel your presence, God. We're looking for those two things and we can become so preoccupied. Our souls become trouble. And this is where we need to learn the art of waiting on God and what it looks like to wait on God and what to do in our waiting. See, so often those of us who are believing and looking for a miracle right now, and I know many of you are, we need to learn the lesson of waiting on the Lord. It's part of it. You look back through the Old Testament, the New Testament, story after story, example after example, moment after moment, where God gives a vision, a burden, a promise, and then crickets. Days, weeks, months, years go by before people see the fulfillment or people see the deliverance or the redemption in their life. But we have the Bible. We see that the story is finished for these people. So we're encouraged. We're like, yeah, like God, you came through for that person. You kept your promises. But for us in our lives, we're wondering, you know, where's my healing? Where's my redemption? Like these stories, when we're in the midst of waiting, uh, we wonder those questions. We get preoccupied with the explanation and the feeling. But here's the thing. I want you to know today that the delay is not denial. There is a purpose in your waiting. And I believe it's in this story where we will learn why God chose to be late, why Jesus chose to stay there for two more days. But let's continue the story. It says in verse 7, And then he said to his disciples, Let's go back to Judea. And so to summarize what happens here, they're like, okay, Jesus says, let's go back. We're going to go wake up Lazarus, okay? And his disciples in verse 12 uh, say, hey, they give this great medical advice. Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. They're not understanding that when Jesus says he's sleeping, that he's referring to death. And so here comes verse 14. So he then he plainly said to them, Lazarus is dead. Lazarus is dead. And this makes me puzzled because just a short verses, a few, few verses ago, Jesus is like, hey, this sickness will not end in death. Well, it just did. What's going on here, Jesus? Then read verse 15. It's more salt in the wound. And he says this, and for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Wait, for your sake, he says to his disciples, I'm glad I wasn't there. Whoa, what's going on? Lazarus, Mary and Martha, these, these people that you love that are going through a time of anxiousness and suffering. 
You're saying you're glad you weren't there to heal them. You're glad you weren't there to come through. We can read that and be like, what is going on? But then he drops this. It's so that you may believe. It's so that you may believe. If you like to underline your Bible or highlight, I want you to highlight this verse right here because we're going to come back to it because this is the spoiler to the story. If you're wondering, why is God making me wait? Why am I going through suffering right now? Why does it feel like God is making me wait on him? Why is he choosing to be late in my situation? The spoiler is this. It's so that you may believe. It's so that you can see and experience yourself the same thing that's going to happen in the story. And if you're wondering what that is, well, well, let's continue the story. But remember that it's so that you may believe. All right, verse 17, it says, On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come, from Martha, uh, come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in their loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Whoa, she's getting real honest with Jesus, right? She's, she's just telling it how it is. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe in who you say you are. I, I have faith in you. And if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. She's getting real honest with Jesus in this moment. And this is important because I think in our waiting, we need to learn how to pray honestly as well. Kind of like how I shared when I was on that beach and I'm just praying to God. I'm like, God, the one you love is ill. I'm angry. Why is this happening? I was talking to God. I was like, God, like I've been working hard for you. I have been in ministry working my butt off. I'm working my butt off with these students. I have just gotten back from winter camp, as you saw in the announcement video, with all these students. I'm doing so much for you, Jesus. And I'm like, why is this happening to me now? I don't deserve this. That's the type of thoughts I'm having towards Jesus. But here's the thing. God can handle our honesty. We need to be honest with God. And you might say, hey, that's uncomfortable to talk to God like that. That's irreverent. I would say that's intimate. God can handle your anger. Just as Jesus is handling what Martha is saying to him in this moment. He can handle our questions. And how on earth can we have intimacy with God if we're unwilling to be honest with him and share with him how we're feeling in situations like this? And we're wondering, why is he wait? Why aren't you coming through? Because it's in that honesty where we're choosing to invite God in. See, from her perspective, Jesus, you didn't show up. He's been dead for four days. This wouldn't have happened if you just showed up. And the moments where she's being honest here, you know what, you're, what she's doing? And the moments where we're being honest, you know what we're doing? We are opening our heart in a vulnerable way for God to be present in our struggle. And we just start to pray honest prayers. And sometimes we may not understand what's going to happen next, but don't forget, delay is not denial. God is not late. He may be late by our priorities, our expectations, but he is never late on his. Jesus didn't show up for a reason. He is up to something in this story, and he's up to something in your story. He's working on your behalf behind the scenes. So let's continue. Verse 22, she says, But I know that even now God will give whatever you ask. Okay, she's showing a little bit of faith. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She's saying, I know I'll see him one day. I'll see him in heaven eventually. And then Jesus says this to her in verse 25, one of these great I am statements. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection that you just talked about. It's not an event in the future. The life you're, you're looking for is not something in the future. It's right now. I am it. I am the resurrection of the life. I am what brings dead things back to life. I have the power over life and over death. And he says, the one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Is what he says to Martha. This is an important verse for us today because whatever situation you're in, in your waiting, 
We have to be reminded with who Jesus is, the truth about him, he is the resurrection and the life. Do we believe that? As we're about to head into Easter, as we're about to head into Good Friday as well, do we believe this? Verse 27, yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. So Martha returns. She goes to Mary and says, Jesus wants to see you. So Mary goes quickly to Jesus and the other Jews who were there to comfort her follow along thinking that she was going to the tomb to mourn Lazarus. Verse 33, as Mary arrives to Jesus, she says the same thing, Jesus, if you were here, this wouldn't have happened. She gets honest with Jesus and see what happens when she's honest. She's inviting him in so that we can get verses 33 through 35. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord. And then we get verse 35. And this, this is the shortest verse that we have in the Bible. And some of you already know it just because it's the shortest verse. Jesus wept. Let's understand this situation. Let's understand what's going on here in this moment. Lazarus is dead. And if anybody could give an accurate explanation, it would be Jesus. If anyone could give a, a good feeling to everyone grieving, it was Jesus. And instead of him giving an explanation, instead of him giving the feeling that they were looking for, we get verse 35. Jesus wept. How long did he weep? How awkwardly long did tears flow from God in the flesh? Be there in this moment with me. Think about this. The God who comes from a place called immortality and eternity, he enters into our linear time and space. And there he sits and he weeps because his friend Lazarus is dead. Because he sees the suffering of those grieving because of Lazarus' death. It says that he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. The actual translation uh, for that in the Greek is the word indignant. See, Jesus was borderline angry. He was agitated, frustrated, grieved, and broken because this was never the plan. This suffering was never the plan that God had. This was not how things were supposed to be. The curse of sin brought this planet into, into fertility. And as a result, there is brokenness. There is pain. There is suffering in our world. Our bodies are broken. But the story shows the nature of God. That he chooses to enter into our suffering. He could have stopped it from happening. He could have kept Lazarus alive. He's done those miracles before for others. And even knowing what he would do next, we still get verse 35. Jesus wept. I want you to know if you are going through suffering, if you're going through a pain, whether it's uh, bodily pain, chronic pain, or a disease, or you're going through grieving, or you're just in a state of anxiousness of, for the future, or maybe it's for uh, you're worried about somebody else who's going through that in your life, I want you to know that because of verse 35, we know that Jesus chooses to enter into our suffering. He chose to be late and he chose to experience that. He's with you in your suffering. He's with you in your pain. And when we're honest and open up in prayer and become vulnerable before him, he enters in. We're inviting him in. Verse 38 says, Jesus once more deeply moved came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, by this time, there's a bad odor, for he has been dead for four days. Look at how preoccupied Martha is with the natural, even when speaking to the one who's supernatural. He, she's like, he's been dead there for four days. Like, he is really dead. There is no coming back for this. I mean, she just said she believed Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the resurrection and the life, but she still doesn't understand this moment. She's getting preoccupied again. No, he is really dead. 
You know, how often do we, even though we have that belief in who God is, we believe he's the resurrection of life, we believe in this event that we're going to celebrate next Sunday on Easter, yet in these moments of suffering and pain, we're still focusing on what's natural. We forget we serve a God who performs miracles and makes a way when there is no way, who works on our behalf behind the scenes, who is the resurrection and the life, who is in the business of bringing dead things back to life. And nothing is over until Jesus says it's over. Sometimes something in your life could look utterly dead or impossible, but nothing is finished until Jesus says it is finished. He says, move away the stone. And sometimes he's going to wait until there's only one explanation. Only one. You're not waiting for nothing. And I can't tell you what the outcome is going to be, but I can tell you he's present with you in your suffering and he has a purpose in it. Why? Because sometimes God will wait until the expiration of your expectation. Why? So he can manifest his glory. The whole point, the whole point of this miracle was to magnify and display his glory so that people would believe in him. Remember what he said to his disciples, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you may believe. See, in our waiting, will you dare to believe something better is coming? Will you dare to believe that something better can happen in your life even right now? She says, it's going to smell, Lord. It's been four days. Then Jesus said to her, verse 40, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? I want you to underline that if you underline your Bible or highlight it on the Bible app. Did I not tell you? Because oftentimes we need to to remember that in the midst of our waiting, in the midst of our suffering. Did I not tell you that if we believe in him, we'll see his glory in our life? We'll see him come through. He'll be there in the suffering with us. Verse 41, so they took away the stone. Then Jesus then said this, Lazarus, with a loud voice, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to him, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Like I just said, sometimes he's going to wait until your expectation has expired so he can display his glory so that people may believe and people may believe around you through your testimony of faith. His delay is not denial. Remember what he said to his disciples, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you may believe. See, this story isn't just about Lazarus. This story is about us. You are the one he loves. It's about you. Think about this. Could he have kept him from dying? Yes. Could he have even resurrected him from a distance? Of course he can. But he chose to go. He chose to be late. He chose to make them wait. He chose to be there in their suffering. He chose to weep. He was deeply moved and agitated because of the curse of sin that brought death into this world, not only to the one that he loved, but caused suffering to the people that he loved as well. And he chose to go there and be with them in the midst of their suffering, all to perform this one miracle of bringing something dead back to life so that they may believe. And I believe in your story today, God may be making you wait so that you may believe. So that through your trust in him, you can see him manifest his glory in your life. Here's why this story is also about you. See, the Jews were flocking to Jerusalem because they heard about this miracle. They heard Lazarus has come back from the dead. And of course, people came uh, by the flocks and they started believing in Jesus. And at the same time, the high priest Caiaphas, this was the last straw for him. He says, Jesus has to die. And you can see in the next Verses after this, the next few little section after this, it says that they plotted to kill him. They plotted his death. It's the Passover this upcoming weekend. Jesus is going to come to Jerusalem. And if we find him, report it to us and so that we can go and arrest him. And that exact thing would happen because of this miracle, like we said in the beginning of the message, this would set in motion all the events that led up to the cross And that would lead to the resurrection where he would once again prove that he is the resurrection 
and the life. And the question is the same for us today as he had for Mary and Martha that day. Do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus is alive today? You know, I know the reason for my pain. You know, I know theologically and doctrinally it's because of the brokenness of this world. The curse of sin has, has broken everything. It's broken our bodies. But this was never the plan. God never intended this to happen. His plan was for us to live forever and because of Jesus, that was made possible. I know that I felt in my situation that God is late. I still feel that now sometimes, like where are you as I'm in pain, even in this moment. But I do know through it, through it all, it's an opportunity for me to dive deeper into intimacy with God, to grow greater trust, to worship with greater passion, to study for hours for this message, for this one story to be brought to attention to me. And not for only for me to hear, but for you to hear as well, maybe. And you know what? I'm not glad he's late right now, but I'm going to wait on you, is what I'm saying to God right now. And maybe that's what you would say today as well. You would say, you know what, God? I'm not glad you're late, but I'm going to wait on you. I'm going to be honest with my prayer. I'm going to invite you into my suffering. I'm going to dare to believe something better is coming and I know that your glory will be revealed so that I may believe, that my faith would increase. And you know what? I know why I can believe in that today as well as because of the stories of so many of you, so many stories of people who uh, come to fellowship who have waited on God and God has revealed his glory in their story and I get to hear these stories. That's one of the, the perks of being a pastor here. I get to see prayers answered and God come through for people and it's such an encouragement because God is in the business of bringing dead things back to life. I want to read this final verse to encourage you today. It's in Isaiah 64, 4. It says, For since the world began, no ear has heard, no eye has seen a God like you who works for those who wait for him. When you wait on God, he acts on your behalf. When you're waiting on God, he moves on behalf of you. His delay is not denial. In our waiting, he's working. In our pain, he is present. And when there seems like there's no way out, he rolls the stone away. And will we dare to believe in that today? And if you do, just perhaps, just perhaps you'll be glad that he chose to be late so that his glory was revealed in your life, so that your faith would increase, so that you would believe and others would believe through your testimony, through your faith, through your belief. The good news is this, of the gospel. Because of the work of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection, because he is the resurrection and the life, by the grace, the power, the glory, and the goodness of God, there is something better that can come for you today and there's something better coming for you for your tomorrow. Let's learn the art of waiting, church. Be honest with your prayers. Invite him into your suffering. Dare to believe that something better is coming.